I'm excited about today. We're, we're continuing to work through our John series, our Image of God series. And um, the word for today is scriptures. Scriptures. We're, if you haven't been tracking along with us, we're working through the Gospel of John. We're doing it methodically. We're doing it slowly. This is season one of this series. If you're going to do John right, you gotta, it's going to take some time, so we're doing it in seasons, okay? Season one and we're taking an image from every passage and we're saying, God, what's the revelation of this image? Because the way John writes his gospel is he uses imagery and these images are meant to uh, reveal something about the nature of Jesus, who is the, he is the image of God himself. He is God revealed incarnate in the flesh, the word made flesh. And so the word for us today is scriptures. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 5, if you want to go ahead and turn there. And today, I mean, I'm just going to tell you that Jesus makes a, a statement about the scriptures, and we're going to talk a little bit about how do we relate to the scriptures? How do you how do you relate to the Bible? What is the Bible, and how how do you read it? How do you know you're reading it well? What's the point of this thing um, as we're seeking to follow Jesus? Is that intriguing to anybody? Yeah, great. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and read from John five starting in verse 31. If I testify about myself, Jesus says, my testimony is not true. Let me just give you a little context. He's been, uh, Jesus is in the middle of a speech right now. So we're like halfway through a speech. If you want to know the first half, go back and watch last week. But he's been talking about how uh, he is the son of the father. And the, these Jewish leaders are upset with him because he's making himself equal with God by calling God his father. And now he's getting to this point where he's talking about the testimony that he is actually the son of God and that he comes from the father. He says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor. And I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John and he's testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John for the works of the father, the works the father has given me to finish the very works that I'm doing testify that the father has sent me and the father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You've never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone, comes, someone else comes in his own name, you'll accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Father, would you speak uh, through me in this short time that we have together? I pray that you would reveal your heart, your way to each of us. And um, I pray that uh, I would... Uh, be a vessel, really, for your ministry, for your word, and that I can get out of the way where I need to get out of the way, and I can pick up what you're saying um, in the moments that you're wanting to say it. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody ever gotten a speeding ticket? Uh, anybody ever uh, had to build a case for yourself in, in traffic court? <laughs> All right, so I got my first speeding ticket when I was in high school. I was taking a friend home from school uh, who needed a ride that day, so I dropped them off, and then I ended up going home a different route than I normally would, and I got pulled over, and the police officer said, hey, I got you going 21 over in a school zone. That's bad. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, you should have known by the flashing lights on that sign that says school zone between the hours of 2 and 4 or whatever time I was going by. Uh, and he says, so here's your ticket. 
Uh, and this was back, I don't know if they still do this, but this was like, they were, it was all about like points on your license back in these days. Is this still a thing? I don't know. I remember being 16 and it was like a big weight on you. Like, no, you don't want too, don't want too many points on your license because then they'll take your license away. And so this was going to be a lot of points on the license. And so I went home and I was telling my parents about it. And uh, my parents are here today. Where did you guys go? I saw you. There we go. Um, I remember, and I remember I, I, I sitting down to tell, I've, and I felt so bad. I was like, oh man, I'd messed up, you know. I'm sitting down to tell my parents I got this ticket, but it had been a couple hours and I'd been thinking about it, like, gosh, I don't remember seeing any flashing lights. Like, I feel like I would have seen that. Like, it seems like it's there for a reason, so that you'll see it and know that you need to slow down. I don't remember seeing the lights on the sign, and I remember telling my parents this, like, I, I was definitely going that speed. Like, I was wrong, you know, but I don't, I also don't remember seeing the lights, and they were like, well, why don't you go back by tomorrow at the same time and see if the lights are on? And I was like, that's a great idea. So I went by the next day, and sure enough, the sign, the lights were not on the, on, on the sign. And it was like during the school zone time, right when I got my ticket. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> so I came home, and I told my parents, I said, the lights were not on on the sign. I think we got something here. And they said, okay, well, let's look into this. Somebody, I don't know if it was my mom or my dad, somebody called the Georgia DOT and like got documentation. They were like, yeah, that sign's been out for months. The lights don't work on it. And we're like, this is good. This is some evidence in our favor. I think we got something in writing saying like, the sign doesn't work on Ross Road in front of Shiloh Elementary School. And, uh, and so I got that. And then my dad was like, hey, you know what we should do? We should take the camcorder I'm just gonna pause, I'm gonna put that there for a minute. Camcorder. This is before iPhones existed. We should take the camcorder and we should drive by again during the same time, and we should record the sign not being on, the lights not being on, and then we'll also get the clock in the car and be like, it is 2:35. And then like, and so we did it. We took the little mini camcorder and we got the video and we built the case. And so I went to traffic court. I'm like, I'm going to go to court. I put my only polo shirt on and my only khakis on. Looked like I was going to church camp or something. I was like, ready to go. Okay. And I, uh, I don't know, you wouldn't wear that to church camp, whatever. Okay, so I'm going, I go to traffic court, though, and I was kind of nervous, but I had, I think I had, like, a giant Ziploc bag with, like, the camcorder. I don't know. I, this is what I remember. Maybe that's wrong. And I had this envelope, and I waited my turn. I finally approached the bench, right? Your Honor, um, I'm here uh, to defend myself against this traffic ticket. Uh, I was 21 over in a school zone, and I, but I have evidence that the sign wasn't working, and if you'd like to watch the mini display on this camcorder, uh, you could see that the light wasn't on at the time that uh, clearly our clock says that it was at that time. He's like, I don't want to see that. I don't care. Uh, I'm going to drop it down to 11 over in a regular zone. And I was like, we did it. <laughs> we won. It was a lot of work that wasn't necessary, it turns out, because the judge did not care about the evidence that we had built in this case. He just believed me, I guess, or I don't know. It didn't matter to him, so he just passed us. He said, if you're going to show up and work this hard, then fine. Okay, I'll drop it down. 11 over in a regular zone, less points than 21 over in a school zone, let me tell you. Uh, so there you have it. This is a passage about testimony, about evidence. What is the case for Jesus being the Son of God in, in, the, in front of the people that he's talking to? What's the, what testifies that he has come from the Father. And he's speaking of five different pieces of evidence. He names five different things that testify that he is who he says he is and comes from where he says he comes from. And we see that they are, uh, they're not relating well to any of these pieces of evidence. Some they're dismissing and some they are, um, they're getting caught up in and, and sort of missing the point of the evidence they've been given. The first piece of evidence, the first thing that testifies that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Son of God, that he names is, the, is John the Baptist. He says, John the Baptist, you love John? John, the gospel writer, sort of paints John the Baptist as somebody that the Jewish leaders celebrated and received. Like they had a real bona fide Old Testament prophet in their midst, in their day. They were proud of John. Some of the other Gospels paint a little bit of a different picture, but this is sort of John's picture. They, they were proud of John the Baptist, but they weren't really receiving or taking in his message, which was a message of total repentance and, and reorientation. But they, they're, they're, Jesus is saying, You've cho you chose for a while to rejoice in his light. He was a lamp that burned and gave light. Many think that's speaking to, he burned, that speaks to his passion. 
gave light, speaking to his revelation. Then he names the works that Jesus has been doing. John names seven signs that Jesus does, the miracles he performs. Uh, He's done three of them so far in the gospel, but there's also a whole bunch of other miracles he's performed, works he's done that haven't been recorded, but they've been alluded to. And at the end of the gospel of John, John says, you know, if we wrote down everything Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books in all the world to contain them all. So he's saying the works themselves are te- the, the, the Father gave me to do, they testify who I am. He says the Father is testified. When Jesus is baptized, John the Baptist hears the voice of the Father saying, this is my son. Now, not everybody else heard it, but there's still testimony that the Father has spoken, testifying to, to the Son. Um, the fourth thing that testifies is the Scriptures themselves. Now, this is going to be our, our kind of key verse today. In verse 39, he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And in verse 40, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's saying that scriptures themselves testify, but you're, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. We're just going to put a little pin in that, put a little Hold on to that. What's the point of the scriptures? We're going to come back to that. And then finally, he says, Moses, he said, I'm not going to accuse you before the Father. Moses accuses you. You put your, all your hope in this guy, Moses, who's like their Old Testament hero, the hero of their faith. And when he speaks of Moses, he also speaks of like, uh, th- this would mean like the, the books of Moses. What, what, uh, in the first century, they would have thought of Moses as writing the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. So Genesis, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Jesus is saying, you read that, and that speaks of me. Moses wrote about me which is being kind of generous. I don't know if you've read the Torah recently, but like there's a lot there that you could get caught up in and not be like obviously one plus one equals Jesus. Like there's a lot in there, right? And so they were really focused on a lot of the details of the Torah of the Old Testament and they were missing Jesus. He, he's saying this was all about me. Moses was writing all about me. But, so he's naming Moses, both the writings of Moses and the person Moses. There's a little bit of hero worship here with Moses. And I don't know. I mean, I want to give a little note, although this is not the point of the sermon, but a little note about honoring our leaders, honoring our forefathers and mothers. Um, and, and it's, you know, history puts a nice little veneer over humans, you know. I think we can look back on, on people who have gone before us and paved the way and and. And forget that, like, they were just flawed humans like all the rest of us, right? And so, uh, so there's this, it, it, we can kind of, like, um, freeze somebody, an image of somebody in time and look back and celebrate them. But not even, if they were here today, like, would I be able to hang? Would I be able to follow this person? Would it be too much? Like, I, like the, I think maybe there's some of that in the first century. They would have liked to have thought of themselves as people that would have been like Moses' people. But would they have been able to hang, really, with Moses and as Moses was following the voice of God. My friend Carl Martin, who uh, is, at this point, he's going to be here in a couple months. He's going to come in May and preach. Um, you guys, many of you have heard from him before. He is a British man who lives in Edinburgh and um, in Scotland, and he's been trying to come back to visit for years, a couple years, but, you know, travel bans and all that stuff. So, but he, um, he, he has said to me multiple times through the years, I love this um, adage. Maybe someone else came up with it. He did. I don't know, but I'm going to credit him with it. He said, you honor your forefathers and mothers by following their principles, not their practices. That doesn't mean that definitely don't follow their practices, but sometimes there comes a point when to honor those who've gone before you means to honor their principles, not just their practices, because so often our practices are contextual, you know? They're based on the time and place that we live, and sometimes those practices actually become irrelevant at some point, or need to be, would, if that person was living today, they would be doing a different practice probably, but driven by the same principle. And so sometimes to honor your forefathers and mothers is to follow their principles. Sometimes it means even to reject their practices if you realize that this is not helpful now. It might even be harmful now. Maybe it was kind of harmful back then. We just didn't realize it. Or whatever. But, like, there's a, but there's a principle, there's a value that, that was driving this person's life. And how do I follow that? That's actually me being faithful to that person who went before me. Does this resonate with anybody? 
right? And so sometimes we miss the point when we freeze our heroes, our forefathers and mothers in time, and we say, we just got to do exactly what they did all the time. And that's, maybe, that, maybe they wouldn't be doing that if they were here facing the same circumstances that we are today. You with me, right? Okay, so Jesus names these five things that testify, though. John the Baptist, the works themselves, the Father, the Scriptures, and Moses. I want to hone in on the scriptures today because I think that more, more than likely we're not going to miss the point with John the Baptist or whatever. Like, I think this is, we're not, most of us aren't sitting around asking the same questions that the Jewish leaders were in the first century. But I think that we do need to know, how do I relate to this book? How do I read the Bible well? How do I not miss the point? I don't want to miss the point in my Christianity in my spirituality, in my religious practice. I don't want to miss the point because this is the recurring theme we see so often with the religious people throughout the scriptures and even throughout so much of history that so many miss the point. So what's the point? What's the point? So first of all, when Jesus is referring to the scriptures, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the Old Testament. There wasn't a New Testament yet that had been written. So he's talking about specifically the law and the prophets, which is what... uh, the rabbis and Jewish leaders would have memorized. It's what the people, they would have read out loud from the scrolls in their synagogues every week. Um, Jesus is what he's referring to in Matthew 5, 17 and 18 when he says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus, knowing that he's the fulfillment of the scriptures, has great reverence for the scriptures. Right? This is important for us. Don't think, and he's, I think he's saying this because maybe we would have a tendency to think that he did come to abolish those things. Don't think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. No, I came to fulfill them. Um, so he, that's what he's specifically talking about when he says the scriptures. Now we have, uh, we have a, we have more to the scriptures now because of, of what we're even reading right now, what was written about Jesus in the early church and within the early church in the first century so that makes up the Bible. So what is the Bible? What is this thing? This leather bound silver leafed thing that I bought on Amazon. Like where did we, where, how did we arrive at this? What is this? book. First of all, it's not a book. It's a library of books. It's a collection of books. 66 books right here, bound in leather. You might have a fancy Bible that uh, has like like nicer leather with a little thing that ties together. Like there's all sorts of different packaging. You can get you can get uh, a cheap one with a paper cover. You can well, you can read it on your phone on a number of apps. This book is actually a library of books, 66 books written by 40 people on three different continents, compiled over around 2,000 years. Lots of diversity in authorship and context, lots of literary diversity. There's lots of different types of literature within this library of books. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got poetry, you've got uh, wisdom literature, you've got history, you've got Jewish apocalyptic literature. All of it, and you've got letters written from one person to another, or from one person to a group of people, and everything that was written was written for a specific purpose in that moment. Paul's letters, he's writing to a church who's facing a specific problem, and he's seeking to help answer their questions, or there's a dialogue back and forth between individuals, and they're working something out, and we, it's like we get to look in on that conversation, we see the revelation within it, and we received from it, but there was a purpose that the the authors had in sitting down to write. Many weren't sitting down to say, all right, let me pin this thing that's gonna be, uh, that people are gonna read for thousands of years on into the future. In fact, many of, Paul and many of the first century church, they didn't think that they were expecting the, the age to come to begin even during their lifetime, right? And yet, so all of that, and yet we have this common thread that runs through the whole thing, ties this whole library of books together, and it's this story, it's this narrative that reveals God and reveals who we are and we're meant to be, reveals the core issues that we face as individuals and as society and reveals um, 
the direction that God is leading all of us in throughout human history. It's common throughout this common narrative. N.T. Wright talks about it um, as like a, a five-act play where he says if you were to look at the scriptures and the story, the narrative of scripture, you've got these five acts. You've got the first act is creation. The second act is the fall, which is just a couple chapters in. You've got the third act is Israel. The fourth act is Jesus. And that now we're living in the fifth act, which is this act of, excuse me, the local church or, or the consummation of all that was promised. And so um, if you like alliteration, maybe the five acts la- labels that would be more helpful is creation, crisis, covenant, Christ, and consummation or church. And I like that. I think that the, the, the narrative itself is speaking to us and seeking to lead us somewhere and take us somewhere. And here's the deal. You can miss the point of what the scriptures are all about if you're not in touch with the story that it's telling. If I'm not in touch with the direction the whole thing is going, then what I end up doing is I read little verses and I go, ooh, that sounds like what I already think. <laughs> now, I like that one. I might even post that one or I might use it in an argument or a debate or I might use it to reinforce something that I already believe about myself or about other people or about God or about the world. And I never let the scriptures shape, inform, or challenge me. And so we need the context of scripture. We need the story, the narrative that it's all going in. And it's a, it's a narrative, it's the trajectory of, of all of scripture. Here's the spoiler. It's going towards an embrace from God towards you and his creation. The narrative, the the thread throughout scripture is a thread of love. It's a thread of justice. It's a thread of hope. It's a thread of resurrection life where there was death and we thought death was the end. It's It's a thread of resurrection. It's good news, right? But so, but so often we settle for gold stars in our Bible class, which is, I mean, you know, memorize the Bible, that's great. But like, we, we settle for being able to pat ourselves on the shoulder that we know something, or we settle for pious proof texting to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. And we end up missing the point of the scriptures. And, and I, I, I think this is worth saying because there are so, there's like thousands of different types of churches and denominations in the world for a lot of different reasons, but a lot of times for this reason. There's nothing wrong with, with disagreeing or thinking differently about something. Um, but sometimes that disagreement even leads us to vehemently abhor one another who think differently or believe, and, and, and we miss the point, right? And Jesus is saying, hey, the point is me. In fact, John, I say this every week, like John knows what he's doing as he's writing this. He's, this is brilliant literature. He's doing this intentionally. He's, he begins his gospel with the word. The word became flesh. He's referring to Jesus as the word and the Bible as the scriptures. This is important. And that's not to pit Jesus and the Bible against one another, but it's to put everything in its rightful place. Because Jesus' critique of them is essentially you read the scriptures and you miss the word. You're reading reading the scriptures and you're missing the word. I'm right here in front of you. It all points to me. It's all about me. And in fact, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the thing you're longing for. I'm what you're looking for. And I'm looking for you. And you're, you're stuck here. And they're actually, they're not just missing the point of Jesus. They're reading the scriptures and coming up with all the reasons why Jesus can't be the Messiah. They're going, well, the Messiah can't come from Capernaum. They don't realize he's born in Bethlehem. Like they're, they're finding little reasons to negate who he is in the scriptures, rather than letting the, the flow of the river, of the narrative of the scriptures of God throughout history, lead them to this God-man who's standing before them now. And we can look back, you know, with 2,000-year lenses and go, what idiots, you fools, you missed the point. All right, glad that that's not my problem today. And 
And we still, we still miss the point, right? There's this, uh, can I read a, an excerpt from uh, N.T. Wright's commentary on this passage? Uh, this is, some of y'all will be like, yes, finally. Some of you will be like, okay, great. But this is awesome. I, I really love this. Um, it's, a, it's a few paragraphs, but this is N.T. Wright, foremost New Testament scholar in the world, talking about this passage, talking about the Bible, and talking about Jesus. I think this is really helpful. He says, Jesus' charge against his contemporaries is thus that they have been looking at the right book but reading it the wrong way. Those of us who spend our lives poring over the Bible as scholars, preachers, and teachers need to take this warning to heart. It's easy to be attracted to the study of the text as an exercise in intellectual brilliance. The Bible is the most fascinating book or collection of books in the world. And anyone with a feel for literature, for ideas, for history, for great stories can become completely absorbed in it. The academic discussions which arise from it can be fascinating, exhilarating, and as challenging and stimulating as any other subject in the curriculum. And God wants the best minds to be working on this job. There's yet more light to break out of the Bible. And if this is to happen, it needs more people to soak themselves in it at every level. But it is possible to allow the study of the text and of different interpretations of the text to become a substitute for allowing the text to bring us into the presence of the living God. It is deceptively easy to know everything about the Jewish hope for the Messiah and not know the Messiah himself in person. And it is all too simple indeed. Sometimes our academic institutions and seminaries encourage it to use our knowledge and intellectual ability to gain status and prestige among our colleagues or among those who belong to the same part of or party within the church as we do. That is as true today as it was in Jesus' day. This is not to say, oh, we're not done yet. This is not to say that we must leave our minds behind when we read the text and simply have nice, warm feelings about Jesus. On the contrary, to read the Bible in the light of Jesus the Messiah demands more thought, not less. I love that. But this thought must always be ready to pass into personal knowledge, into adoration, into prayer, and then back again because there will always be more to study from Scripture to Messiah and back again and so on to and fro in an upward spiral of understanding that is the challenge which this passage presented then and presents to us still. N.T. Wright, brilliant, from his Jesus for Everyone, or John for Everyone commentary. This is the challenge, right, that we don't miss the point. Each of these things that Jesus is saying testify to himself, they're meant to be avenues of revelation. And so often, the, the, his hearers then, and we do this too, turn those little avenues into cul-de-sacs. And we say, this is it. We camp out, we build a little house right there, and we say, this is the point. We make an end out of the means. In the scriptures, God-inspired, revelatory, authoritative, brilliant, are there as a means to the end of adoration and communion with Jesus. Not so that we might puff ourselves up with more intellectual knowledge. Because so often, y'all, if you peel back the layers, what we see is that really serves my ego more than anything else. I can feel good about myself and what I know and what I'm learning and miss, miss the creator, the most powerful and glorious and loving being in existence, who as in Revelation, John, the same guy wrote the book of Revelation, and so much speaks to this. The curtain is pulled back and Jesus is revealed for who he really is. Jesus is just saying, hey, I stand at the door and I knock. If you would just open the door to me, I'll come in and I'll eat with you. We can commune. And that's the, I, I think the scripture is if we'll let it and if we'll uh, engage with it well, the scriptures can be that table that we commune over even, Right? I think a good way to judge, hey, am I relating, how, how am I relating to the scriptures? Am I doing it well or not or somewhere in between? I think we judge by the fruit. What is the fruit of my study? 
And what I mean by this is, do we see the fruit of the spirit or the fruit of the flesh at work? Um, I, Sam's going to be preaching this passage tonight, and I love, he, he brought up this verse when we were talking about this earlier this week, 1 Corinthians um, 8. I don't know why my iPad does this a lot. It cut off the number at the end of the reference when I pasted this in. But anyway, uh, it's the verse that, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. <laughs> I love that. Paul is saying, you think you know something, but you don't know what you don't know. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. There's actually a footnote in that verse that says, whoever loves truly knows. Mm. There's a difference in thinking you know, thinking you have something figured out and living in love. So what's the fruit? What's the fruit of um, how I'm, in, I'm relating to the scriptures? And it's my heart as a pastor that we would be a church full of people who love the Bible, read the Bible, know the Bible, and the fruit of our relationship with the scriptures is love that builds up, not just knowledge that puffs up. Are you with me? Is this a good word? Yeah, I think it is. All right. So, G- so John starts off by saying Jesus is the word. The word became flesh. And, and he comes to us. He moves into the neighborhood. He's incarnate. He's revealing himself. And then the same John writes in Revelation, these, we see these pictures of Jesus revealed. And, and John says um, in Revelation 1, actually, can I read this, this um, verse to you really quickly? We did a series last summer in the, the um, seven letters in Revelation. It was really great. Uh, and it's, spoiler, all about Jesus. But... Uh, is, I mean, it's, I don't know, I think for many of us, it, you realize, oh, this book of Revelation is different than I thought it was. But Revelation 1, 12 says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Same language that, J- that Jesus is using about himself earlier in the passage in John. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest, um, he goes on to describe him more and more and more. In his right hand, verse 16, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like a sun shining, the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. I don't know. I just keep thinking about the fact that we're all going to die. Whoa, Rob. Warning, please. Someone did a spit take. We're all going to die. You are going to die one day. You will close your eyes on this life and open them on the next life, the age to come, and before you will be Jesus and his glory will be fully seen by you. You will see him as he is. And I believe we will experience a tangible love like we could never even take in with our five senses in this life. That's why I think we see the, the glory and the love of God. I think we, that's why we see the people in Revelation, they're bowing down and then they're standing up and they're, they're at each new angle, these living creatures who are covered in eyes, which is super creepy, are seeing a new, a new uh, angle on, on Jesus and they're just, every time they, they see him, they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. It's like there's no other words left besides this word holy because of the, what they're constantly experiencing in his presence, unhindered by the veil that we live with in this life. And I don't know, I think in that moment, when I think about myself, I, I, and I, I've been reflecting on this a lot recently, um, if I'm honest, I'm at my best when I'm living with the in the reality that I'm gonna die one day and I'm gonna have this moment and this experience. And then all the stuff that I'm dealing with right now in my life like starts to, um, starts to shrink a little bit. 
all the stuff that I'm anxious about, all the stuff I'm stressed about, all the stuff that I'm afraid of or worried about, all the stuff that I think is really important finds its rightful place at the feet of Jesus. And um, I, I think the thing that I want for myself more than anything in the world, actually, is to know that glory and that love as much as I possibly can now. And let that shape me. Let that affect how I live and how I relate and how I, um, how I relate to my wife, how I relate to my kids, how I relate to my work, how I relate to my community and to the world. Um, and that's, as a pastor, that's actually the thing I want for you, too. That's what I want for our church. More than to do a building campaign or to see a budget increase. or Like, honestly, what I want is for you and for us to experience the glory and the love of Jesus that puts everything in, the, in its rightful place. There's so many ways that we in the world right now and that the church in the world right now is getting caught up in our little cul-de-sacs, you know? About really important issues. But I, I believe that, that that experience, that moment doesn't erase all the stuff that matters to us now. It just, it brings it all into the right alignment. It brings clarity. It helps us healthily relate to all that stuff. And so uh, what we're gonna do is actually the band's gonna come back up and um, they're going to sing a song that I, I really, it really means a lot to me that they're singing this song. This is one that Kirby and I wrote together recently and really wrote it from this place of, we're going to die. <laughs> I know, you keep, I keep saying that. You guys are like, stop saying it. We are. We're going to die one day. We're going to be, we're going to find ourselves. And I keep picturing myself as like an old man at the end of my life, knowing What's coming next? Having lived a good life, you know, you want you want that. But there at the end, and what's the perspective that I, I might have then? And and what are the words that would authentically come out of my heart then? And all the questions that I'm asking now seem to fade away then. I even in writing this song was thinking about the person who's Faith has been really challenging in this season of your life. Maybe you've struggled with, do I even believe this stuff? Or what? Like maybe you've kind of put the Bible down indefinitely and you go, I don't know. I can sing that song, I think, but I don't know if I can read that thing. Or maybe you've got some serious questions about, maybe you feel like God has abandoned you and you've got some serious um, challenges with how you think about God right now. And I'm picturing being before that throne <laughs> And all of those questions, they have an answer now, and they don't matter as much now. Um, I think about the person who's loved and lost God, finding him again, and then before the throne going, I didn't, I, I had no idea how good he was. Jesus, right now, our, our prayer is um, that we might see you and experience you and get just a taste of your unveiled glory and love. Parentheses, I know this isn't, this ended up not being a sermon so much about how to read the Bible, but a sermon about Jesus. Um, which I'm all right with, but God, help us to find you in the scriptures. Help us to be those who seek you, who search the scriptures, not to prove you wrong or to cast judgment, but because we're curious about how you might show up on this page and who approach each day with the curiosity of how you might show up in this day. 
And right now, would you give us just a glimpse of your love, your power, your glory, your presence. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.